On October 24, 2020, Malaysian Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin made a request to the King to declare a state of emergency amid a surge in COVID-19 infections in the country. The proposal was made ahead of the crucial make-or-break vote for the government's 2021 budget this month. A state of emergency would have allowed Mr Muhyiddin to pass the budget without a vote. And it all happened against the backdrop of a persistent lobbying by UMNO for greater executive power, as well as a challenge for the premiership from opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim, who claimed to have a majority in parliament. By having an administration with a razor thin majority, it creates a base for those ambitious leaders from both sides of the aisle to claim the top position in the government. Failure to pass the budget would be tantamount to a vote of no confidence in Mr Muhyiddin's government, and that could trigger an election. I think it was a political move. Because if you remember, we've already had an MCO, a movement control order, which did not require any declaration of emergency. A pandemic doesn't need an emergency to be handled. It shows you are just incompetent if you have to resort to emergency, take away powers from parliament. The emergency proposal was eventually turned down by the king. A statement of support by his key ally, Amno has given Mr Muhyiddin a temporary respite. We already announced that. We support the Perikata National, the government. But will the ceasefire mark the end of Mr Muhyiddin's political troubles? March 1st, 2020, the day when Mr Muhyiddin Yassin was sworn in as Malaysia's 8th Prime Minister. He heads a new coalition known as Parikata Nasional, or the National Alliance, following the collapse of Pakatan Harapan government of former Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad. The resignation of Dr Mahathir on February 25th this year made it possible for a new coalition government to emerge, led by Mr Muhyiddin, having convinced the king that he had the majority support of Malaysia's 222 members of parliament. Many Malaysians thought they voted for change on May 9, 2018. That was the day when the opposition Pakatan Harapan ousted the ruling Barisan Nasional in a historic victory after more than six decades in power. But today, they feel shortchanged by the political developments in the last seven months. That's the sentiment of 26-year-old co-founder of Undi 18, or Vote 18, Hira Yusri. Vote 18 is a group that seeks to lower voting age from 21 to 18. I think as a young person being on the outside, uh, you know, as a non-politician, as just a youth advocate, to see all of this unrolling in front of me was very unnerving as well. Seeing how these politicians take our votes and the mandate that was given to them so lightly and going into these discussions without consult consulting any of their constituents was very demotivating. And I think even when we speak to other young people, it, it felt like uh, these politicians did not take the, our votes seriously. So it's very frustrating to see all of this happening and you can't really do much about it. At the beginning, it was still unclear if Mr Muhyiddin had a majority support in the lower house of parliament to form the government. However, that became clear on the July 13th parliamentary sitting when Mr Muhyiddin tabled a motion to remove the House Speaker Muhammad Arif Muhammad Yusuf on the ground that there was a new candidate for the post. The outcome of the move by Mr Muhyiddin was watched very closely within the political circles as the vote served as a barometer of support for his newly formed government. 
So Tan Sri uh, Arif was appointed during uh, Pakatan's time because of the majority. And in the same way, he can be removed uh, if a majority of MPs want him removed. It is unprecedented. Uh, if you follow again the law literally, it can be done. Mr Muyedin finally managed to clear months of uncertainty over his parliamentary majority by replacing the Speaker. But he won by a whisker. Only two votes separated his coalition and the opposition. Since then, it's become increasingly clear, especially to the opposition parties, that not all is well with the Perikatan administration. We've never seen a stronger opposition with 108 members of parliament now. We used to be 109, but one MP passed away. Uh, and 113, that is really the slimmest of majorities. If two people are not there, there goes the, the government, you see. This is the first time we're seeing a government with uh, such a narrow majority, one or two seat uh, majority in parliament. We've never seen this before. The government has always had like very uh, comfortable majority in parliament. So by having an administration with a razor thin uh, majority, it uh, creates a space for those uh, ambitious leaders from both sides of the aisle uh, to claim the top position in the government. Of course it's not a stable, it can never be a stable government. It was not a government voted in by the rakyat. If you came in on your own through the back door and appoint your own people and fish in uh, people who think can be supporting you because of some rewards or, or other, well, that cannot be stable, isn't it? And the challenge to his leadership started to pick up momentum from then. Former Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad has been trying to push through a vote of no confidence against Mr Muyidin ever since the new Tarikata National Government was formed. But until today, the move to challenge Mr Muyidin's parliamentary majority has not materialised. The way our parliamentary system works, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the agenda is set by the government of the day which was why the motion of no confidence was uh, never given uh, priority by the uh, House Speaker. And the challenge facing Mr Muyidin's leadership is not only from outside the ruling coalition. The government is also rife with internal political struggles. One of its key component parties, AMNO, has said it will not formally join Parikata National. It's even threatened to withdraw its support for the ruling coalition if the fresh demands for a cabinet reshuffle are not met. We're not threatening. I don't like people to, to misconstrue us as if, as if that we are uh, good or threatening the power that be. But what has to be done has to be done. What has to be said to be said. The numbers of members of parliament from AMNO is bigger than any other party like Bersatu, PAS, you know. In other words, our support is so significant, so important, but we actually uh, not being recognised as a partner with that kind of support. It's not fair to accuse us of being power crazy or, you know, we are greedy for position. You know, we ask for what we deserve. It has very small or very narrow majority, only a two MP majority compared to the rest of the opposition. And so as a result, uh, it has several layers of problem. Number one, the narrow majority means that uh, it is always at risk of not being able to pass bills in parliament. Number two, the leadership is always held hostage by individual MPs or specific political parties, you know, demanding uh, for concessions and advantages. Uh, so you have that uh, dynamics going on you know, almost continuously throughout the entire period of this new administration. On the other side of the political divide, Pakatan Harapan has been waiting for its chance to grab power from Perikata National. It feels that it has been robbed of its victory after winning the mandate from the people to govern in the 2018 general election. And now, it wants to reclaim the position it once held. 
This is returning the mandate of the people. We won GE14. Unfortunately, we were betrayed in uh, the February uh, Sheraton move. Uh, and uh, in order to bring back uh, that mandate yeah, to uh, its proper place, which is the continuation of some form of uh, Pakatan Harapan, uh, the leadership is, is part of that administration uh, and complete with the reform agenda. Another leadership challenge soon followed suit. This time, it came from opposition leader and former ally Anwar Ibrahim. What will be the outcome of the ongoing power struggles and shifting alliances? Will this set the precedent for the formation of more backdoor governments in Malaysia? On July 30th, 2020, former Chief Minister of the East Malaysian State of Sabah, Shafi Abdal, dissolved the Sabah State Assembly. His decision paved the way for a snap election. And that came two months later, on September 26, 2020. But just three days before polling, PKR President and leader of Pakatan Harapan Coalition Anwar Ibrahim dropped a bombshell. He declared that he had a majority support from MPs to form the next federal government. Suffice for me to say, uh, it's not a small majority. It's a convincing, formidable, strong government we're talking about. We need a strong, stable government to run this country and save the country. Mr. Anwar even secured an audience with the king to prove his claim. His hardcore supporters firmly believed that Mr. Anwar's 22-year wait for the premiership was about to come to an end following his announcement. But to the naysayers, they argued that the move by Mr. Anwar was nothing more than a political ploy to fish for votes ahead of the Sabah state election. It's also to relay hope to the people that he remains on track to be the next Prime Minister. Anwar is Anwar. Lah. He is aspiring to be a Prime Minister. He will try, you know, everything that he can. So let him do whatever he wants to do. He's not going to distract us from our main agenda or our focus to serve the rakyat, to serve the people. Yeah, that is my comment. Nah. You know, if I am in his position also, you know, as a president of the party, you know, my aim is to form the government. By making uh, that announcement, he was actually, perhaps he was trying to kill uh, two birds with one stone. Uh, one is uh, to show that he's still, uh, uh, he's still in the running to be the prime minister before the general election. And two, he, would, he was also giving a, a boost uh, to his allies' campaign uh, in Sabah uh, to help uh, Warisan because his party was uh, aligned to uh, uh, Warisan. But if Mr Anwar's intention was to influence the outcome of the state election, it certainly did not go according to plan. In the closely contested election, Parikata National Coalition won with a simple majority of 38 seats. But it further rattled the unity within the Parikata National Government. And that came after Muhyiddin decided to appoint Hadiji Noor from his Basatu party as chief minister instead of appointing an AMNA candidate, Bung Mokhtar. We are not happy because uh... I think we, we are the largest uh, uh, political party that have won the election in Sabah. You see? So by right, Amno and with our component there, you know, in the BN, we deserve to be considered 
the post of chief minister. But uh, even then, before the result of the election was out, you know, the president of Bersatu already announced who would be the chief minister. I think what happened in, in, in Sabah just uh, confirmed uh, Amno's uh, Amno members' uh, suspicion that Bersatu leaders cannot be trusted. It's a significant development because uh, obviously Amno is uh, being uh, played out by, by its own allies uh, in Sabah. Although it was uh, Bung Mota was the obvious choice, but it went to a Bersatu candidate. Apart from helping Parakata National's victory in Sabah, AMNO candidates also won three other by-elections under the Barisan national flag. The latest victory was in August this year. An AMNO candidate, Muhammad Zaidi Aziz, won the slim by-election in Perak by a landslide. He garnered 13,060 votes, defeating Dr Mahathir's Pajuang party candidate Amir Kushari Muhammad Tanusi, who only managed 2,115 votes. So I think that is uh, the main issue that many leaders in AMNO cannot tolerate. Because if they feel that if I'm doing all the work, I'm providing the missionary, I'm you know, riding on my old track record, and I'm bringing my voters out, and I'm winning most of the seats, uh, why should I let someone else be Prime Minister? You know? because the power is so concentrated in the office of the PM, so everybody wants that seat. And that includes the opposition leader, Anwar Ibrahim, who announced on September 23rd that he commanded a strong, formidable and convincing majority in Parliament to form the next government. But his meeting with the King, which lasted about 30 minutes, revealed nothing of substance. Mr Anwar is said to have submitted documents to prove that he has the support of 120 parliamentarians. When uh, Dr Sri Anwar went to have his audience with the King, uh, with the Yang Dipetuan Agung on the 13th of October, uh, he had uh, several documents, some of which were letters from party leaders stating that they had 38 MPs, 42 MPs, 11 MPs, as in the cases of, uh, for PKR, DAP and Amana. Uh, but also a uh, statutory declaration uh, by individual MPs who supported him, as well as uh, a letter yeah, from uh, yeah, other party leaders uh, to state that they have a certain number of MPs supporting Dato Sri Anwar. However, the palace says the opposition leader did not present the name list, but instead only informed the king about the numbers. There were two possible reasons why he didn't uh, uh, come up with a name list. One, he didn't actually have the numbers. Uh, two, uh, some of the people supporting him could be in the current government, uh, which is why he didn't, uh, uh, he didn't uh, uh, present the, number, the, the names uh, to the king. According to an analyst, another way to prove his majority is by filing a vote of no confidence against the prime minister. No likelihood that that's ever going to see the light of day. So I think even if Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim really had the numbers, you know, it would be very hard for him to realise it because the avenues for which he can display or show those numbers are very limited by the circumstances that we are currently in. And then, you know, it needs the cooperation of the king in order to seek and have an audience and for him to gather people. And now that we have a situation where, you know, there is a, a very strong advice from the palace to keep things calm, reduce politicking. I think all of this I think will you know, be in the real view mirror. That's also the sentiment of 35-year-old Niza. His food business has suffered tremendously due to the pandemic. The last thing he wants to see is a continued political bickering among politicians who are jostling for power and positions while the people suffer in silence. I think I would appreciate it if they kind of waited, allowed the country to properly handle the health crisis, also the economic crisis together. 
and then only later on, you know, do what they have to do. Because at the end of the day, life and death is health and the economy. So I think uh, to me, if, if more resources, more time and effort was paid towards handling this crisis, the health crisis, I think we wouldn't be in so bad of a situation now. Malaysia is now grappling with the public health crisis and its economic fallout, as well as rising unemployment. There are ample signs to suggest that Malaysians are getting weary with the never-ending power grab attempts. They want stability and economic prosperity to return and resent a continuous political infighting which would hinder economic progress. Is Mr Anwar making the right move at this moment to reclaim his right to rule? But, you know, again in Parliament, you continue to play the numbers game. You play, you continue to have baits for fishing. Frogs like, running around and uh, leaping from one pond to another, literally, you know. It's frog politics, leapfrog politics, I call it. Will never end. And in the meantime, the pandemic is on us. This is not just Malaysia, I see it happening in, any, in many other countries too. So perhaps this is an era of uh, politics of frogs, globally. Constitutionally speaking, a Prime Minister can only hold his position if he has the confidence of the majority of MPs in Parliament. So if you look at it that way, yes, um, Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim is entitled to do what, what, what he's doing. But whether or not, again, uh, practically speaking, morally or ethically speaking, that, that's a different question altogether. After his failure to declare a state of emergency in the country, and with the growing pressure coming from all sides, including a leadership challenge from Anwar Ibrahim, as well as the deep division within his Parikata national government, can Mr Muhyiddin keep his fragile coalition government intact. Perikata National's victory in the recently concluded Sabah state election is of great significance to Mr. Muyidin. It has strengthened his credibility amid a leadership challenge from opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim. It's also put him in a stronger position going into the next general election. Unfortunately, after a sudden spike in COVID-19 infections just two weeks after the Sabah election, a snap election is the last thing that the country needs at the moment. Several politicians, including a federal minister, were infected with the coronavirus, forcing some areas, such as the Klang Valley and neighbouring Selangor, to be placed under a conditional movement control order known as CMCO. Compounding the problems, the rumblings of discontent were also getting louder from within its key coalition partner, UMNO. You've seen intensified statements and, and actions by uh, UMNO leaders, particularly those that are not in government, that seems to indicate they're moving away from supporting Mohidin as Prime Minister. They have not outright pulled out from government, but they've given a lot of signals that they're not happy uh, being in coalition. And the results of the Sabah state election you know, has further exacerbated this uh, you know, adversarial or, or negative mood that's pervading. It's, been part of a, a continuing series of statements and actions that show uh, that they were unhappy with the partnership, the state of the partnership, uh, and that I think Anwar was able to take advantage of that situation uh, for that moment. In fact, some UMNO leaders had initially expressed support for Mr Anwar's bid to become the next Prime Minister. Among them, former Prime Minister Najib Razak and party president Zahid Hamidi. Mr Zahid had said that he would not stop its UMNO lawmakers from backing Mr Anwar's attempt to form the next federal government. 
Supreme Council member Padudin Abdurrahman admitted that the matter was discussed at the party's top policy-making body. We have discussed it. To be honest, some people will accuse me, say, oh, why are you last time against Anwar and now suddenly, you know, you're talking about Anwar, okay? We, we discuss it, the pro and cons, okay? And in Amno, the pro and the against, you know? But the main, the main issue is that uh, people are not in favor, and I also, I would not support it as long as DAP is with Anwar. We don't want DAP to be part of the government. I think some elements in AMNO might have different views and might not have a fundamental problem in working with uh, Datuk Sri Anwar or even DAP, one dares to say. But uh, we've been saying for a number of years now, no Anwar, no DAP. And we've been telling the public that and we've been telling uh, our grassroots that and we've been justifying to ourselves, why we joined Perikata National based on that. To suddenly swing around and go 180 uh, to support the very people you, you supposedly despise and you supposedly use to justify everything that we've done, uh, that calls into question the integrity of AMNO itself if we were to do that. Some leaders in AMNO are not satisfied with the current position that they are in with uh, Mohidin Yassin. Um, that Amno feels that they have lost dominance and I think the way to resolve that is to have uh, an election. Uh, so how to uh, have elections during this you know, COVID situation? So I think the, the interim stopgap measure was to, you know, let's shift support to someone else so that we at least don't have to work under uh, the current leader. We can work with someone else who might be able to give us you know, more say over the country's policies. So I think that's uh, the thinking that went beyond it at some circles, not the entire leadership, but some circles within AMNO leadership. AMNO's displeasure with Mr. Moeden's leadership did not end there. AMNO Secretary General Ahmad Maslan had even threatened to withdraw its support for Perikata National if they failed to agree on the new terms set by AMNO. The first demand is to appoint a Deputy Prime Minister from UMNO by virtue of it being the biggest party in the ruling coalition with 39 lawmakers compared to Basatu's 31. And secondly, to have a cabinet reshuffle that would accord more important portfolios to its party leaders. Currently, two of the senior minister positions are held by Basatu. They are Trade and Industry Minister Azmin Ali and Education Minister Muhammad Radzid Muhammad Jidin. Amno has one. He is Ismail Sabri Yaqob, who's overseeing the defence portfolio. So what's the problem? Is it something wrong? Is it anything wrong? We are in politics for what? We are in politics, we want power. Power for what? to serve the people. If we have no power, no position, what can we do to serve the people? And the riot, you know, looking up to us to do the best we can for them. So the post as a Deputy Prime Minister, strategic portfolios are important for us to serve the people. Anything wrong with that? So please, uh, I hope the media will not play it up that we are power crazy, we are crazy for position. No, you know, it's not at all, you see. And this post Deputy Prime Minister, you know, I think we deserve it. As I've said earlier, I'm not as a main uh, contributor to the government, the formation of Prekata National. But will Mr. Moyedin bend over backwards to appease his key ally? And what does it mean for the Perikata National Government if he concedes to AMNO's demands? Will it help to restore stability and put an end to the endless internal bickering within the coalition? 
giving UMNO the DPM post is no guarantee that the government will be more stable. In fact, I think it could even uh, lead to a more uh, unstable government as uh, UMNO's uh, ambition is to lead the government. So as DPM, you're essentially, I don't know, uh, one heart attack away from becoming the Prime Minister. So that could lead to a more unstable government. What's clear is that within UMNO, leaders seem to be divided among themselves. Each faction is taking a different position on how to bring the party forward or elevate its position within the grand coalition. But what's quite clear is that the group that wants to stay in government or walk out from government, neither of them are strong enough to oust the other. So there is a kind of standoff that's going on within UMNO. So hence you see, you know, uh, mixed signals. You know, one day I want to walk out from Perikatan National, but at the same time, you know, a few days later then, okay, there is this olive branch, you know, I want to reconcile. Just a week after threatening to pull out of the coalition, UMNO declared a political ceasefire and declared its support for the Perikata National Government. I think UMNO is a big party. Um, it's also a party that's not used to be out of government, not used to not having the uh, trappings of power. And I'm not talking about nice shiny things, I'm talking about how power flows almost seamlessly uh, from government position and party position. Not in any dodgy way, but just you know how, how power is distributed and influence is held. Uh, a party that is still very feudal, um, one has to admit, but when the decision is made, I think even our opponents will admit that UMNO is, for the most part, quite disciplined. Uh, so once uh, a statement is made, once a position is made, uh, most of us toe the line, or at least be quiet about it. A few days later, Mr Muidin made a move that sent shockwaves across the nation. He made a proposal to the king to invoke an emergency rule to curb the spike in COVID-19 infections. But the move was met with a strong resistance from civil society groups, as well as ordinary Malaysians, including Mr Niza. He feels that an emergency rule would cause a lot of uncertainty in the country, and that could be bad for the economy. I think the word emergency gives a very panicky impression. I've never lived through an emergency. The only emergency I've heard of is from, you know, back in, you know, back during, during the communist time. So that emergency and this emergency is <laughs> vastly different. But I think the fact that, uh, you know, if it causes a lot of confusion and it causes a lot of uncertainty for people. And when that happens, you know, people naturally, you know, Restrict. I mean, people naturally stop spending, lah. Uh, I think, and that, and as an economy as a whole, it will, will really, uh, will really derail our our economy as we recover, lah. Critics have also denounced his proposal as nothing more than an attempt by the prime minister to cling onto power. Yeah, I think there was a lot of uh, fear going around because of the word emergency and, and I think people assume that if it was declared it was going to be a big change and, and cause a concern. So I think that was the, the main fear that, that people had that once you declare an emergency the federal government through the Prime Minister now has very very wide-ranging powers to make ordinances, to suspend parliament, uh, to provide for supply bills for fundings and, and all this could be passed uh, without having to go through parliament. I guess uh, the immediate uh, objective uh, at that time when the, uh, when the application uh, to the king uh, was made was to make sure that the budget could be passed. But uh, emergency powers essentially is like a, it's like a blank check for the government. So they could do anything. Since the country's independence in 1957, Malaysia has only proclaimed four emergencies. During the 1964 Indonesian confrontation, the May 13 race riots, and the political crisis in Sarawak and Kelantan. But this time, the threat level is different. I think that they're doing the right thing by going to the king. But um, it was not right 
for them to make such a proposal. There's no necessity. And uh, this has been, uh, look as if that uh, it's more political uh, attempt by the, <laughs> what do you call, uh, the cabinet to curve activities, political activities that might um, uh, threaten their position in the government. The proposal to declare a state of emergency in the country was then rejected by the king. While he trusted the government's ability in curbing the spread of the disease, he didn't find it necessary to impose an emergency rule. He also called on all politicians to put an end to the endless politicking which could destabilize the government. All of a sudden, a sense of calm has returned to the country. But for how long? Since Muhyiddin Yassin was first sworn into office as Malaysia's eighth Prime Minister on March 1, 2020, he has come under intense pressure from his political opponents. His former ally turned political nemesis, Mahathir Mohamad, has tried several times to bring down his government through a vote of no confidence in Parliament. But until today, the bill has yet to see the light of day. Opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim has also made a similar attempt. He claimed that he has the numbers to take over the government. Even internally, its key political ally, UMNO, has been piling pressure on the Prime Minister to reshuffle the cabinet and give UMNO a bigger share of cabinet posts, including some of the main portfolios. But what's really led to this frequent contestation for power and influence in Malaysia is the formation of the so-called backdoor government on March 1st to blame for the current state of affairs. I am whole these backdoor moves, backstabbing, and playing the numbers game. Politics is not a numbers game. Governing the country is not a numbers game. Who cares what numbers you have? What is important is that, is the government stable, strong enough to formulate the kind of policies that the country and the people need? This counting of numbers and fishing for votes and support is really very disgusting. But to me, having been in politics for so long, when it comes, uh, culminates in a situation where in order to stay in power, in order to stay in office, in order to stay in your position, you bait people with money, with positions or whatever promises, that is really ridiculous. And for the rakyat, for the people, it's a betrayal of their trust. Even many Malaysians have not taken kindly to the constant tussle of power at a time when the country is still battling to contain the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. Until today, Kira still cannot come to terms with the fact that the new government has emerged without the people's mandate. She feels that all parties should respect the electoral process and the people's verdict, instead of forming a government through the back door. Clearly, there was, no, there was no mandate from the people to see uh, Perikata National in power, especially because certain parties who clearly lost in the general elections. So just because uh, you are in government, it does not mean that you were voted in, it does not mean that you were selected by the people. And all of this like horse trading and all these um, 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 discussions, as a citizen who is left out of this, uh, these conversations, it makes it very difficult for me as a person to be able to uh, see the current coalition as the leaders that I want to have. The same sentiment is also shared by 32-year-old writer Lim Mei Li. We live in a country that is supposed to uh, follow democratic processes. Um, for that to truly happen, it needs to be a government that was elected by the people. And if, 
if it doesn't work, then the next general election, we will vote again. That's how it's supposed to work. Uh, I will never agree to a backdoor government. Uh, they are already here, so it is what it is. But I am uh, very much against the idea of it ever happening again. It's not democratic. <laughs> it is like, who? I didn't vote for these people. What's the point of having elections then? What a waste of money, right? It costs millions of ringgit to hold one. Leader of Basatu, Azmin Ali, however, says that Parikata National Government was born out of a tumultuous period that occurred back then. We have to accept the fact that uh, when we formed this government, it was from a, a political crisis that took place early this year. It was not coming from an election. We realised that. That's why the arrangement, the setup, and the majority is there, but still very small. Uh, if you ask me, certainly we want to go back and get the mandate of the people Recommend. to have a stronger government that can focus on the rakyat and the economy. But unfortunately, due to COVID-19, I don't think this is the right time to call for election. And I think this is the right time for us to save and protect the life of the people and to revive the economy. According to experts, such power grab is legal and it remains acceptable under the system of parliamentary democracy like Malaysia. When one leader no longer commands majority, you know, someone who can do so can then be appointed to lead uh, government. Uh, the problem, I think, emerges in that the leader that has emerged, you know, the current Prime Minister, is unable for many, many reasons, you know, to expand the support that he has through other parties. So far, he's only had four major parties supporting him, which is GPS in Sarawak, PPBM, his own party, AMNO and PAS. And that only gives him, you know, 13 MPs. Uh, 113 MPs, just a two-seat majority compared to his opponents in the opposition. So that is the underlying problem that, you know, it could be front door or back door, you know, but you need to have sizable numbers in order to have a stable uh, government. At the moment, all seems quiet on the political front. After the king issued a decree calling on parties to stop all politicking that could disrupt the stability of the government. UMNO, on its part, has declared its support for the government. It's also committed to a political ceasefire and ensure that Budget 2021 will enjoy a smooth passage through Parliament. We know at the moment we have to focus on the riot. You know, we have big issues, big problems with the economy, with the COVID pandemic. So, we would like to support, give the best support we can to the government to do their job. But at the same time, we hope that we are taken seriously. No problem. What's the problem at the same time to give uh, your partner a due respect, a due recognition, give them what they deserve? All these things will not affect the government efforts to serve the riot. Normally, this fire occurs the opposite sides where the warring factions stop fighting. But this is, Abno is in government. Abno is part of Perikata National. So, I don't know why he makes so much uh, demands or issues after it. Um, he should be part, he, he is part of government. So it's very strange for Abno to allow him to, to do what he did. I mean, one day, making demands on this and that. I would expect, if you want stability in the country, that if you're part of the government, that you behave uh, in, in solidarity with the government, the parties in the government. For example, I see PAS as being consistent. You know, it's part of government, and it stays solidly behind the prime minister. I think that's what Amno should be. Unless, of course, you do not want to be part of government. I wouldn't call it ceasefire because it suggests that there's an all-out war uh, in the background. Um, this arrangement uh, should last, in my opinion, for as long as uh, for as long as our country is facing far bigger problems that 
require the whole political class to come together on key issues. For now, Prime Minister Muhyiddin's position appears to be safe. Still, he'll have to continue to tread carefully in his dealings with the key component party in the coalition. UMNO, as it gears up for an election sometime in the future. But will a general election help to resolve the intense struggle for power in Malaysia today? Or will it just be a temporary solution? I mean, it could potentially lead to another razor-thin majority government. But I think, principally, that could be uh, uh, the best way uh, to, uh, uh, to end this uncertainty. And the reason why we have this uncertainty, although it's a raised in majority government, because also Pakatan Harapan, uh, the leader of the opposition thinks uh, the government was, the, was stolen uh, from them. So hopefully with the general election, uh, no side can claim that the, the power was snatched from them unfairly. It remains unclear for now how the political developments will unfold as the various parties mull over the next move. Will Anwar Ibrahim make good his promise to prove his parliamentary majority and achieve his long-held dream of becoming the next Prime Minister? Or is it nothing more than an empty promise? Will Amno break ranks with the Perikatan government if its demands are not met? Or is the party simply too divided to dictate terms to the Prime Minister? In the midst of all these challenges, some observers still believe that it's early days to write off Mr. Muhyiddin, at least for now. I think people have underestimated him since February. But I think he has got some good operators, some good team work. And I think as much as Amno would like to portray that they have the numbers, to uh, create problems for the ruling government, maybe they don't have. Because you may have the numbers, but if you don't have solidarity, if you have factions that aspire for different things, <laughs> then you're not solid. You cannot be a threat. So I think the ceasefire will hold. I think the Prime Minister will, will be there, and the party will continue to rule. Until such time as you have solidarity amongst those who do not want this government. Despite the King's advice, it remains unthinkable for politicking to end in the country. Political jockeying for power is likely to continue even after the pandemic eases. Mr. Muhyiddin's razor-thin majority in Parliament has made him highly vulnerable to challenges, even from those who are aligned with him. Will he be able to fend up the threat and consolidate his rule? Only time will tell.